Hello again and welcome to another Warlord Wednesday, the episode of the week where we talk about all things bolt action. In today's video, I will be taking you through my recommended beginner army list for the armies of Great Britain. Now to be 100% clear, this video is aimed at newer bolt action players. It is not the best list, it is not the most meta or competitive. It is designed around a British starter army and it's very much aimed at those people who maybe are looking at the sprues in front of them and they're just not sure how to build them. Maybe you're just a bit worried that you're going to build a model in the wrong way, you won't be able to use it later on. Don't worry, don't panic. In this video, I'm going to take you through step by step each unit in the army list and I'm going to tell you what weapons I've given each model in those squads and I'll even give you a little bit of rationale and tactics behind why I've picked certain bits of war gear. The main aim of this video is to help you build your army list in an effective way that will allow you to start playing some games and having fun with the amazing system that is Bolt Action. And so with all that said, let us dive right into today's episode. Now, before we get into the units themselves, there are a few other factors and criteria I want to cover. Firstly, this will be a 1000 point army list. This tends to be the typical game size for bolt action, and it certainly feels like the size of game that it's balanced around. You can find game groups that go up to 1250 and maybe even 1500 points, but in my experience, building for an 1000 point game tends to be the best choice. On top of this, we are going to be limiting ourselves to a single generic reinforced platoon and we're going to only allow ourselves to take a maximum of 12 order dice. Now, there's nothing in the bolt action rulebook that says you have to do this. You can take as many platoons and as many dice as you want. But again, most communities, the general, I would say, community comp for bolt action is stick to one platoon unless you're doing a special game and don't go above 12 order dice. This might all sound very competitive, but trust me, this is the kind of regulation that you want to be having in your game support action because otherwise you can have a Soviet player turning up with 26 dice at a thousand points and it just gets a little bit unbalanced. So when you're building your army list and you're playing your game with your friends, you're getting into it at the same time, I would recommend that you go for a thousand points, single platoon, 12 order dice limit. And one last thing before we get into the list itself, I will be building this list off the British and Canadian Army 1943 to 1945 Bolt Action Starter Army. So don't worry, you don't need to be hunting around for lots of weird and obscure units. We're going to be building all of this from a single starter army box. This box contains 36 British or Canadian plastic infantry, a British Army MMG team, a British Army medium mortar team, a British Army six pounder anti-tank gun, a universal carrier and a Churchill infantry tank. It's a very well-rounded starter army. It contains all of the infantry, weapon teams and vehicles that you need to create an effective beginner bolt action force. If you're thinking of getting into the game, you're not sure which starter army to go for and you want to collect British, I highly recommend this box set. Okay, with all of that covered, I think it's finally time that we get into the list itself. At the top of the food chain, we have our officer. We are going to be taking a first lieutenant. He will be equipped with a submachine gun and he will have one extra man accompanying him who will also be equipped with a submachine gun. The reason we are going to go with a first lieutenant over something a bit cheaper, like a second lieutenant, is because we will be running lots of regular infantry in this army. And we want to make sure that our guys are going to obey their orders. So having the extra plus two leadership that comes out from a first lieutenant will be very, very important. It also allows us to do an extra snap to action, meaning we can activate two units and our officer at the same time. This is very important, potentially even game winning. Being able to pull off a mass maneuver like this is a rare thing in bot action. Typically, you have to wait for your dice to come out of the bag, but it might just allow you to pull off a big push that can sweep an objective or destroy a vital enemy unit before they get the chance to hit you with it. 
Now, the reason we've gone for just the one extra man is because we want this squad to count as a small team. If we only have two or less men in the unit, it means that our squad gets an inbuilt minus one to hit modifier. You'll find this applies to all sorts of small teams like snipers. It's really, really good and it makes your squad significantly more durable than stacking an extra wound in there that will just get picked off and killed. Much better to have that minus one to hit and not be hit at all than to be easier to hit and to have an extra wound. We've taken this officer as regular. That's because first attendants are a little bit pricey, so we need to have that balance between spending loads of points on a veteran officer and having enough points left over elsewhere in the list. And we've given them SMGs because, well, they're free. On your officers, you don't pay for the upgrades, so there's no point in looking a gift horse in the mouth. A couple of free SMGs might just make the difference at a key point in the battle. As well as the first lieutenant, we've also got the free forward artillery observer. This is something you get as British. It's part of your faction trait, as it were, and it allows you to call in one free off-map artillery bombardment. Once you've done that with your observer, he just runs around essentially as a dice in the bag and he can also be equipped with a submachine gun, so why not? This brings us on to our bread and butter, our infantry squads. And in this case, we have gone for three 10-man regular infantry sections. These are mid to late war and every single man in these units, including the NCO, has been equipped with a rifle. This might seem kind of strange, just slapping 30 riflemen into the list. I know Brits can take some machine guns and Brens on their infantry squads, but bear with me. As part of playing British, one of the benefits you get from this is you have a flexible faction trait. We've talked about the free forward artillery observer where you can also pick from things that make you better at combat things that allow you to remove pins but the one that i personally believe is the most beginner friendly is rapid fire how this trait works is really simple across your whole army for every three models in a squad that are equipped with a rifle you get one extra shot this means that when you've got a 10-man infantry squad, you will get three extra shots. Now, when you compare that to a light machine gun, such as a Brent, which gives you four extra shots, but there's also a guy that has to load, it actually balances out. And so you're benefiting from three extra shots whichever way you go. But if you take rapid fire, you're not then having to spend 20 points on a Bren gun. So it saves you points and you can use those elsewhere in the list. I think it's just a great introductory faction rule. It's really easy to get your head around. It's going to benefit a lot of your models. You're not going to forget it at a key point because shooting is the main part of bow action. So it, for me, it all just makes sense. But I have left off at the end of this list, and I'm skipping ahead a little bit here, a few points. And the reason I've left a few points off, I think this list comes in at 945 points, is there may be those players that aren't interested in rapid fire. There may be those players that want to take Bren guns and Stens and Thompsons because that's a more historical and fluffy narrative thing to have in your infantry sections. In that case, those extra points that we've left off, you can use those to put those weapons back into your squads and you can always pick a different faction trait. But moving away from the debate around weapons and rapid fire, let's just focus on the squads themselves for a moment. The reason we've taken three 10-man squads is it just gives you a really solid core to the list. You've taken them all as regular, so they've got good shooting, reasonable survivability, and you've taken them in sufficient numbers where if you make a mistake here and there and it might cost you a few casualties, it's fine. You've still got enough guys to make sure you can get the job done. Whenever I'm building a bolt action list, I always make sure that I take two to three squads of regulars just to make sure that I've got that skeleton and then I can add on the other bits on the list. But speaking of add-ons, now let's take a look at the support units because it's all well and good having lots of infantry and a good officer, but they can't handle everything. There's going to be those times when you need a unit that can just bunker down on an objective, throw some pins around or tackle some of the tougher enemy squads such as veterans and also tanks. To start off, we've gone for a slightly controversial choice, the medium machine gun team. 
Now this is just regular, so it costs us 50 points, and it's just an MMG team. Three guys, one machine gun, five shots. The reason this is slightly controversial is because within bolt action competitive communities, the medium machine gun is kind of seen as a little bit of a lackluster unit. It only puts out five shots, and it's very susceptible to things like artillery and also sniper fire because this thing can't move and shoot. So unless you're willing to move this around all the time, a mortar will inevitably start zoning in on it. And a sniper is going to try and pick it up as a first opportunity. And when he does, that will be a dice out of the bag. So if it's got all these problems, why have we taken it? Firstly, it is a relatively cheap dice to have in the bag. It's only 50 points and it does get you something that can sit on an objective and lock it down. Also, five shots with a long range like that is not something to turn your nose up at. I've often run snipers and they spend the whole game just missing on that three plus or failing to get that four plus to wound. It can happen. But when you have a medium machine gun team, essentially what you're paying for is a pin a turn. And that pin might just be the difference between stacking a minus one to hit on your opponent so he doesn't hit you as much. It might mean that your opponent doesn't pass his order test. It's fine. And if the medium machine gun team gets taken out, well, frankly, it's kind of done its job. If that sniper is going after the machine gun team, it's not going after something a bit more important like your officer. And if your opponent has spent a lot of firepower in other areas, maybe a mortar to zone in on your machine gun team, again, you don't really mind. Sometimes it's okay to have a semi-effective unit in your dice bag that if it dies, doesn't completely cripple your game plan. And the last reason, and to be honest, probably the most important one is it comes in the starter army. So you don't need to go out and buy anything extra. You can include a medium machine gun team. And once you've got to grips with your first few games, maybe it will be one of those units that you swap out for something else as you start expanding your bolt action collection. But for a beginner army list, it's more than okay to include one of these things. But our next support team is considered one of the best. From one extreme to the other, I am of course talking about the medium mortar team. In my opinion, medium mortars are the perfect balance between power and points cost. They come in at 50 points for a regular one and you will need to spend an extra 10 points so you can get a spotter and you need to do this so it can fire indirectly effectively. But you also, for that 50, 60 points, get a two inch HE template. This is really nice. It means you can slap it down on an enemy team Typically, you'll get all three or four models under the template. And if your opponent is running some bigger squads of infantry, it's going to force him to spread out because if he doesn't, you're going to start getting lots and lots of casualties from your explosives. It's just great. It's cheap. It's powerful. Your opponent can't hide from it. It counters a lot of things like snipers and weapon teams. And you can't go wrong with a bit of HE. Every bolt action list should, should have some high explosives sprinkled in it because not only are they quite powerful weapons, but they also put lots of pins. A single medium machine gun team can put a pin on an enemy unit. A medium mortar with a good dice roll can put three. That can make a squad ineffective for a turn. And if you're only playing a five or six turn game that could be as much as 20 percent of that unit's effectiveness just being taken out of the battle because they had to spend a turn just rallying or reorganizing so medium mortars are great never ever leave home without a medium mortar this should be the first thing that goes in nearly every one of your bolt action lists so far all of our support teams have supplemented our anti-infantry or pinning capabilities but we of course need some anti-tank this is bolt action. There are going to be tanks, and considering we're talking about a British list here, your most common opponent is going to be the Germans. And if there's one thing you can guarantee about German players is they love their tank. Most German players will probably turn up with a Panzer III or a Panzer IV, but it is not uncommon for them to bring a Tiger tank to the game. Are they competitive? No. Are they an absolute pain in the ass if you're not ready for them? Hell yeah. 
So we need to make sure that we're bringing sufficient anti-tank to cover ourselves against the heavy armor, but we're not over-egging the pudding. We're not overcompensating and therefore reducing our anti-infantry capabilities too much. With that in mind, our first anti-tank option is going to be a Piat team. Piats are strange weapons. They've got good armor penetration, plus five, and they even benefit from the shape charge rule. They only fire one shot and it's a small team. So it's only two men, so they have that minus one to hit. But the big drawback for them is they've only got a 12 inch range. This means that unlike the American Bazooka, which has a 24 inch range and therefore once in position can kind of stay behind a bit of cover and just let off rockets at the enemy, the Piat needs to get up close and personal. Honestly, I would consider your Piat team like a suicide anti-tank option. Typically, it's going to dive out, get a shot off, it'll either blow the tank up or it won't, but whatever happens, it's probably going to die in the return fire. Honestly, I find Piat teams to be more of a psychological anti-tank weapon than an effective one. Your team does have the punch to get the shot off and to do damage, but more than likely, all you're going to do is force your opponent to keep moving his tank away from the team. However, that is going to keep stacking a minus one to hit modifier on the tank. And so in a funny sort of way, as long as the payout team keeps doing that, it means that the enemy tank is being made much less effective. If you get the kill, great, but you don't need to for the payout team to do its job. On the completely opposite hand, we have got a six pounder medium anti-tank gun as another bit of AT. Now, the reason this weapon is so different to the Piat is it's got a 60 inch range and also it's a three man team with a fixed special rule. It does fire one shot. It is the same penetration as the Piat team, but it's much longer range. But on the flip side, it's also much less maneuverable. Your six pounder basically has to stay still to be able to shoot. It can turn on the spot if it needs to get an angle, but that requires an advance order. The only way it can move is if you give it a run order and then it can only move six inches. Bigger anti-tank guns like this work very differently to Piat teams. Rather than running around and chasing and harassing tanks, you deploy them down in an area. You lock that area down, you cover a firing lane and you make it very, very unappealing for your opponent to move their tank into that firing lane because one of the first things you want to do with an anti-tank gun is put them on ambush, presuming you don't have a clear shot at the enemy tank from the beginning of the game. This just makes it really difficult for your opponent because either he has to just not go into an area of the board, an area of the board where he might be needed, his tank's fire support might be vital in turning the battle around, or he does move into sight of the six pounder, at which point it lets a shot off. And with pen plus five and a good half range, there's a chance that you just knock that tank out. But let's move on to the final part of the list and everyone's favorite bit, the vehicle. To begin, we have the small yet mighty Bren carrier. This is a tracked vehicle with armor seven plus and it can carry five blokes. We've given it an extra LMG. And to be honest, this unit has one job to transport the Piat team. If you try and foot slog the Piat, it's never gonna get anywhere, anytime. You put it in a Bren, suddenly it's hypermobile and it can actually not only be a psychological threat, but drive up to enemy vehicles, jump out and maybe, just maybe, get that one shot pop on the enemy tank. And secondly, we've got the big tank. I like them big. I like them boxy. I am, of course, talking about the infantry tank Mark IV Churchill IV, which from this point on, I will just call the Churchill. The Churchill is a really nice tank. Not only is it a heavy tank, which makes it pretty durable, but it's also got a very flexible loadout. It's got a turret medium anti-tank gun, which can help supplement your other anti-tank and means that even if you come across an enemy heavy vehicle like a Tiger, you've got two medium AT guns and you've got the PR team plenty of AT to just keep wanging shots into it, eventually one of them will stick. But it's also got two medium machine guns, a forward-facing one and a coaxial one. 
This means you've got the volume of fire to also scythe down enemy infantry. It's a very flexible unit and is suitable for many different battlefield roles. You can use it on the attack, you can use it on the defense. What I love about the Churchill is its price point. Most German heavy tanks, such as the Tiger, will come in at about 400 points, which is eye-watering. In a thousand point game, that's 40% of your army on a single unit. But uh, the Churchill 4 comes in at a paltry 265. This is because whilst it's very well armoured, it's only got a medium anti-tank gun. But honestly, between that and the other anti-tank you've got, it only needs a medium AT gun. It's more than sufficient. The great thing about you bringing heavy armour though, is it's going to be a pain in the ass for your opponent to deal with. Most German players expect allied players to turn up with something like a Cromwell or a Sherman, but a Churchill, it changes the game. Uh, a heavy tank like the Churchill fundamentally changes the nature of the game. If your opponent can't deal with it, it's going to have the opportunity to run rampant. And even with just the medium AT gun and the machine guns, five, six, seven turns of that is going to have a huge impact on your opponent's army and is really going to start racking up the casualty. But that's it. That's the entire list. So in summary, it's a first lieutenant regular with one extra man. It's three infantry squads, all 10 man with rifles and rapid fire. We've also gone for a free forward artillery observer. All of this is regular. We've got a medium machine gun team, a medium mortar, a Piat team, a six pounder, a Bren carrier and an infantry tank Mark IV Churchill IV. In total, it is 11 order dice and 945 points. Like I said earlier in the video, I left off 55 points. So if you want to put a couple of brands and five stands in, you absolutely can. If you don't, and you're wondering how to make up those 55 points to get you to the 1,000 points, what you want to do is take your Piat team and your Bren carrier as veterans. This is because they'll probably be coming in as reserve units, so you want to have that extra leadership so that they can pass their reserve test. And you also have enough points left over to make one of the infantry sections a veteran one rather than a regular one. You do that and you'll get yourself up to a comfortable 1,000 points. Overall, this is meant to be a really balanced list that allows you to use all the models from the starter army and it contains plenty of infantry, vehicles, weapon teams, anti-tank and even a little seasoning of high explosives as well. You should be able to use this list to get a good grip of the game, learn how different units work and it should be a good starting point for your bolt action journey. But of course, all of this is just like my opinion, man. Let me know what you think down in the comment section below. What would you change about this list? And are there any other beginner army lists you want me to do in future videos? Of course, if you've enjoyed today's video, don't forget to smash that like button and also subscribe to never miss an episode. And I just want to say, if you found today's video particularly helpful or informative, then please consider becoming a channel member or Patreon supporter. By supporting the channel, you will not only be helping me create more content, but unlocking loads of perks for yourself, including access to the Mordian Glory Discord server. This is an online community with over 2,000 active members. It's always popping off in the MG Discord. We have got channels for army lists, tactics, hobbying, painting, and even a pretty spicy meme section as well. And I just want to take a moment to say a massive thank you to all of the current channel members and Patreons. You guys are amazing. You truly are the lifeblood of this channel, and I could not do Mordian Glory full-time without your generous support. And last, but certainly not least, I want to say a personal, special, heartfelt thank you to all of my top-tier supporters. These are the War Masters, the people that have truly gone above and beyond the call of duty. So a massive thank you to Bon Bon Vert, Ken Starr, Mark Panconi, Swordfish Trombone, John Stubbs, Nicholas Walsh, Diesel Fox, and August Barney. Thank you guys. Your ongoing and incredibly generous support makes a huge, huge difference. And I am eternally grateful to each and every single one of you. I hope you've all enjoyed today's video. 
Thank you for watching, and of course, as always, I'll see you guys next time.